First of all, there's no single molecule or chemical associated with happiness, but that the chemical milieu of the brain and body is important for setting the stage or the opportunity for happiness. Hence why there are treatments aimed at alleviating depression or mania that target certain neurochemical systems and hormone systems. Happiness, at least the way I'm framing it today, has essentially two components. One is meaning. That is what sort of meaning do certain types of interactions or behaviors, could be work, could be social interactions, et cetera, carry for us. And nested in that is this concept of connection. And we talked a bit about tools for enhancing connection, things like eye contact, but not constant eye contact, things like being very present to a conversation or an activity that you're engaging in. Remember, we talked about the paper, a distracted mind is an unhappy mind, the paper published in science. And we talked about the study also published in science in which giving money, but also knowing how that money has positively impacted others leads to this feeling of pro-social connection and happiness in the giver and in the receiver. And I should mention again, that it's not just the giving of money, but also the giving of effort and time and attention that can have similar effects. So we have meaning and connection and a number of different ways to access those. And then we have this access that I'm referring to as performance and resources. And I'm talking about performance and resources as it relates to natural happiness, not synthetic happiness, but natural happiness, because we would be wrong, I believe, if we were to say that income doesn't matter. I think it's fair to say, based on the research, that income matters and income that can cover costs of living, plus that includes some buffer. And what do I mean by buffer? I mean, buffer to the anxiety that circumstances might change is important. Now that's going to vary from person to person, meaning some people will be perfectly happy making $1 more than their absolute cost of living every month. Other people will require a more substantial buffer in order to protect them against the negative psychological effects of worrying about, for instance, inflation or worrying that they might lose their job. And this is why I think most people recommend having, if possible, some buffer in their bank account that could cover two or three or maybe even six or maybe even 12 months of living expenses were they to lose their job or something catastrophic happened to them. So if we're going to talk about happiness, I think it's only fair, only accurate, and frankly, only respectful to talk about living requirements and cost of living requirements that includes this sort of buffer and that that buffer to anxiety is going to vary depending on how anxious somebody gets about the possibility of catastrophic things happening to them, like losing their job or their rent going up or doubling. And here I'm talking about hypotheticals, but I think we all know people and perhaps ourselves have experienced those kinds of circumstances. So when we talk about happiness, we, we absolutely need to think about resources and we also need to think about performance. I think we would be completely inaccurate if we simply said, oh, you know, any work leading to any outcomes, you know, any effort, regardless of whether or not it gets you an A in school or an F in school, isn't going to impact your happiness. I don't think anyone would agree with that. And yet, if you look at the major takeaways, at least as they are communicated, typically in the public sphere around the longitudinal and short-term studies of happiness, the takeaway generally is more focused on social connection and how money is not important. I don't think anyone that's saying that actually means that income that can cover your expenses plus some buffer isn't important, but it's often not stated. So if we were to come up with a general model of happiness that includes various tools for how to increase our levels of happiness, I think it's only fair to include both natural and synthetic forms of happiness and to pursue both natural and synthetic happiness. Just to remind you, natural happiness is the kind of happiness that we associate with obtaining something either by effort or because it was given to us. Although I definitely want to highlight the fact that receiving things that don't require much reward in order to receive them over time can be detrimental to our dopamine system. That's an important aside. The other form of happiness is the form of happiness that we call synthetic happiness, which is for instance, focusing on social connection. And we talked about ways to do that. 
as a means to enhance your happiness, right? Again, the, the language, the, the name synthetic happiness implies something kind of artificial, but frankly, genuine social connection is genuine. There's nothing artificial about it or synthetic about it. It's that you can synthesize it through action, through deliberate action. Likewise, being focused or encouraging yourself, working on being focused on whatever activities you happen to be engaged in, positive or negative, is known to increase your levels of happiness. Again, this is a form of synthetic happiness. You're not obtaining anything new or additional as a consequence of this. It's entirely internal, right? There's no external reward. There isn't more money that arrives with this or a better grade. Although I would make the argument that if you are present to the work you're doing in any context, physical or mental work, it's very likely that you are going to perform better at that work. So we have natural happiness and synthetic happiness, and both of them require our attention and effort. And in fact, if we were to draw a link between natural and synthetic happiness, it really is this concept of presence, of really being focused on what we're doing that's most likely to lead to the outcomes that we want, both externally in terms of receiving monetary rewards or grades or praise or whatever it is that you happen to be pursuing out there, resources of some kind, and presence and striving to be present when in the pursuit of so-called synthetic happiness in the form of social connection or in the form of really focusing on the choice that you've made and making the best of that choice, especially since you made that choice in a way that you deemed best at the time, well, that also is known to increase your overall levels of happiness. So if an ability to focus and attend to things deeply is really what's most important and really acts as the greatest lever for both natural and synthetic happiness, well then tools like a five minute daily meditation or a 13 minute day meditation, as well as tools that allow us to get excellent sleep every night, which of course sets the basis for attention during the day. If you've ever had a poor night's sleep, then you are very familiar with how hard it is to focus the following day, at least for long periods of time. But building our capacity to focus through a focusing exercise, which again is often called meditation, but is really simply just a focusing and perceptual exercise, that's going to create an outsize effect on all the aspects, all the behaviors that we know feed into creating natural and synthetic happiness. And so it's really fair to say that our ability to attend and focus really equates to happiness.